Good morning, everyone. Y'all ready? We'll get going. Brother Larry Britt, would you open us up in prayer, please? God is good. He still answers prayers. You got your Bible with you? Say amen. All right, tool for the toolbox today is coming from 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9, resting in God's faithfulness. When life seems to fall apart, we often wonder, where is God? Why hasn't he answered my prayers? The Bible offers us encouragement, knowing therefore that the Lord your God he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his faithfulness to a thousand generations for those who love him and keep his commandments. Five attributes of God makes this possible. First, he is omniscient, which means he knows everything, including our every need, thought, and life situation, not just present, but also past and future. Second, God is omnipotent, so nothing too hard for him. Third, he's omnipresent, so he's never beyond reach. Fourth, our Heavenly Father can't lie. Everything that he says is true and reliable. And fifth, God is unchanging. Our circumstances and the world may seem to be in constant state of flux, and God may even modify the way he chooses to interact with us, but his character is always the same. So when Scripture says God is faithful, and we can rest confidently upon that promise. In situations that seem overwhelming, we can trust that our sovereign Lord knows all, is in control, and lovingly works everything out for our good. We can rest confidently knowing that the unchanging God of all the creation is taking care of us. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. Welcome to Union Baptist Church. If you would, please stand and join us for praise and worship.
trained if you'd like to go to children's church you may head on back
this place I stand, holy ground, holy salvation when everything around you is just going out going up in smoke or in shambles or as the song says when everything's shaken I've never been more glad having that peace that surpasses all understanding so as we sing this song this morning we, we worship in our, our Savior who gives us the firm foundation but if that's something that you don't have or, or maybe you've had it but you need to get back to it um, and go back to your roots that's our prayer for, for you this morning Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus, because He's never let me down. Faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. And I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength I built my life on Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So I would be He won't, he won't fail, he won't fail, he can't win, look what my house was built on.
On the road again, the long and winding road. You know, songwriters love to use roads as metaphors for life. Jesus did too. He spoke to the disciples about wide roads and narrow roads. When people traveled in Bible times, they did it just like I'm doing now. They walked from place to place to place. And as they walked, they wore away the vegetation and ended up with a hiking trail just like this. This is a road in Bible times. Some of them were narrow, just like this, maybe 24 inches in width because they were very lightly traveled by the locals. As soon as they get out into an environment where international travelers are moving, the roads get wider, as much as 15 foot wide, traveled by lots of more people and armies and chariots and carts. What did Jesus mean when he said, wide are the roads, broad is the way that leads to destruction? Well, think about it. He was talking about the kind of roads 
used by international travelers. The roads that led out into the greater Gentile pagan world where an understanding of the one true God was absent. But the narrow roads, the ones that lead up to Jerusalem, where the Lord had revealed himself as the one true God, those are the narrow roads that lead to life. You know, you and I don't maybe walk as much as people did in Bible times. And when we think of a road, we don't think of this as being a road. But we have this in common. The kind of road we walk spiritually has consequences. We make choices about how we live. And I'm wondering, what kind of road, narrow or wide, are you walking today? Good morning. I invite you, if you would, please take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. And and I don't have a a very long, I don't have a lengthy introduction for you this morning to kind of step us into what we're going to be talking about today. We're just, we're going to jump right in because today brings us to the final portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that we've been studying for the past several weeks. And in these final verses, Jesus kind of brings his message to a, to a conclusion. He, in essence, he sums up everything that he's been talking about since this message started at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5. And, and so he's, he's really going to be driving home this main point of what it is his, his entire ministry, his entire earthly ministry was about. And it really comes down to this. The Jews knew that the Messiah would be coming for the purpose of setting up God's kingdom. The problem was that the Jews believed something completely different. They expected something completely different than what Jesus was actually teaching. Jesus was different than what they were expecting when they expected the Messiah to come and set up God's kingdom. And God's kingdom, according to Jesus, was very different than what they were expecting. And so basically it comes down to this and and, and asks this question, who is going to join Jesus in his kingdom? How can, how can one get into this, this kingdom of God? And, and I've heard it said many different times before that, that when we approach this question about how to, how to gain eternal life, I've heard it said that this is the most important question that anyone can ever ask and seek to find the answer to. But I don't think it's a, it's a coincidence that that, that is the purpose of Jesus' teaching when, when we have the, the largest collection of Jesus' teaching in one place here in the, the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think it's a, a coincidence that Jesus is seeking to answer that question, how do I get into heaven? It, it wasn't a question of, of whether there is a heaven, whether there, there is an eternity. It wasn't a question of whether, whether there is life after this life. The question is... How do I get in? How do we approach getting in to the kingdom of God? And so we're going to jump right in here and and look at what Jesus taught about getting into the kingdom. And we're going to read our passage of scripture today by by section as we, we look at each of these different things that I believe Jesus is trying to teach us today about getting in to the kingdom. And the first is this, we find it in in, uh, chapter, in verses 13 and 14, and and Jesus shows us that there is a specific way that we are required to get into heaven. So please follow along with me here as we read verses 13 and 14 together in chapter 7. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. 
And so Jesus is, is telling us that there's two distinctly different paths that we follow in this, in this lifetime. And he says that we, we enter on to those paths through two distinctly different gates. And, and there is a broad road that, that people enter on to through a broad gate, meaning that it's very easy to get in. It's very easy to be on that path. And there is a narrow road, and, and the way on to that narrow path is going through this narrow gate. Now, of course, Jesus is not talking about a literal sense here. He's not saying that there are two paths that people walk, and, and you literally walk through a narrow gate to get to the narrow path, and you literally walk through a broad gate to get to the broad path. He's talking about a way of life. He's talking about our lifestyle. He's talking about what we do in our daily decisions. And each one of these ways of life leads to an eternal destination. Now, in our day and time, there, there are a lot of... And, and the same way it has been throughout all of history, there are those that would propose that there are different options than what Jesus is teaching us here in uh, these verses. There are those of us um, uh, among people today that would say that there is no eternity. There are those people that would say that we are, we're born into this world as physical uh, beings, even mental uh, be, uh, beings, and even emotional beings. But there are those that would say that there's nothing spiritual about us. There are those that would say that there is no eternity, that we, we come into this world, we live this life, and then we die, and then that's it. Their belief and their teachings are that, that we are just organic matter, organic material that's alive today, and then we're dead tomorrow, and we cease to exist. Then there are those that would say that, that we, we complete this life, that there is a life after this life, but their teaching is that when we complete this life... We enter into another life through, through many different means, whether it's through incarnation or, or any other type of mean. But, but it's dependent upon how you live this life to how you come back in the next life. And, and it's just this cycle of if you, if you do good deeds in this life, then you, you get an upgrade when you go into the next life. It's, it's kind of like when you, when you upgrade from the iPhone 14 to the iPhone 57. And, and it's, it's in that matter, but, but if, you, if you live a life that is, is filled with, with negative acts and negative characteristics, then, then you get demoted in the next life, and you you got to try again. you got to try and start all over and, and, and make your way back up. And then there are also those people that would, that would say that, that there are multitudes of different options. In fact, there are some people that would say that all roads lead to heaven. But that's not what Jesus is teaching here. The author of eternal life says that there are only two options that we must choose from. In his word, it says that there are only two options when we leave this life. He says that there is heaven. There is this place of eternal perfection in the presence of God. And that is for all of eternity. And, and Jesus says that the only way to get to heaven is to enter through the narrow gate and to walk along that narrow path. It means that, that there's a very specific way that we must live our life. And there's a very specific way to start and to go about living that life. And if you manage to live your life in that way, that way leads to eternity with God in heaven. But then if there is a heaven, then there also must be a hell. And if there is a hell, it is a place of eternal punishment. And, and the worst thing about this place called hell is not the punishment. The worst place, thing about this place called hell is the absent of, absence of the presence of God. And Jesus says here that, that this path, the, the path that leads to this place called hell, is a broad road. It's a heavily traveled road. And the way people get on this road is through a broad gate. One that allows many people to enter into. See, the point is, is that we all live forever. You know, we, we go through this life and, and some people have this idea of, oh, well, I want to live forever. Well, everybody lives forever. 
The question is not whether you will live forever. The question is where you're going to spend that forever. The question is where you are going to live in eternity. And Jesus says that the only two places, the only two options are heaven or hell. Now Jesus also says about this, uh, this, this specific way, he says that there are many who would follow the wide path. There are many that enter into that wide path through the, narrow, uh, through the wide gate. Do you know why there are many on that path? You know why Jesus says that, that there will be lots of people that travel this path? There are lots of people on that path because that's the easy path. That's the easy route. It is the natural way that we would travel through this life as human beings. You don't have to do anything special in this life in order to make your way along this path and to enter through this gate. If you do absolutely nothing apart from your natural tendencies, this is the path that you find yourself on. Every single one of us born into this world, this is the path that is our default setting. See, all people are born into this world as sinners. Every single one of us naturally break God's law. That's the result of the curse of sin. That's the result of, of the very first sin that took place in the Garden of Eden. And we inherit that tendency, we inherit that nature from our parents, from their parents, from their parents, all the way back to Noah, and then all the way back to Adam and Eve. This is our default state, living in sin and being in opposition to God. And, and you might would say, well, well, nobody in their right mind would ever choose to go to hell. And, and some people have even said, I've heard people say, I'm not going to make that decision right now. I will wait and I will make that decision about where I'm going to spend eternity. I'll wait till I'm older. I'll, I'll wait till I've lived and I've enjoyed and I've, I've, I've wrung all the fun that I can, all the enjoyment that I can out of this life. And then when there's nothing left in this life, then I'll make that choice about where I'm going to spend eternity. Then I'll give my life to God. I've heard it before and I'm sure that you have as well. But you know, by doing nothing, by putting off what you think is putting off that choice... By not deciding, you in fact are deciding to follow the broad path. And Jesus then says that there are few that follow the narrow path. There are few that enter into that path through the narrow gate. And just like there was a reason that there are so many people that are on the broad path, there's also a reason why there are so few people on the narrow path. And some of you are probably thinking already, well, if, if there's so many people on the broad path because it's easy, then the logical reason is that there are so few people on the narrow path because it is difficult. No, it's not difficult to be on the narrow path. It's impossible. It is impossible for us to enter in through that narrow gate. It is impossible for us to travel that narrow path. At the beginning of, of his Sermon on the Mount here, Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 48, he says, you are to be perfect because your Father in heaven is perfect. See, that is the standard. God's perfection is the standard for entering through that narrow gate. God's perfection is the standard by which we must continue to travel along that narrow path. And it is impossible for any of us to do that. That's why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Another way of saying that is we've all messed up, we've all broken God's law, and we've fallen short of the standard of perfection, which is what God requires in order us to have eternal life in Him. And so you might be thinking, well, if it's impossible to travel down that path, if this is an impossible path, then how can anybody ever be saved? How can anybody ever travel down that narrow path? How can anybody ever enter into that path through the narrow gate? That's where Jesus comes in. 
You see, we cannot live a perfect life that is required to gain eternal life. We can't do it. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came and he lived that perfect life. Jesus came as the perfect sacrifice. Jesus came and lived a sinless life because we couldn't. And then when, when sin, which, which the Bible goes on and it says in, in Romans chapter 6 verse 23 that the penalty of sin, the wages of sin or what you earn because you were a sinner is death. Because of that, Jesus lived his perfect life and then he went to the cross and he died and he gave up his life so that our debt of sin could be paid. That's why Jesus came. That's why he came and he taught these things. He came because he wanted us to know how to get into heaven. And when we place our faith in him, he gives us his life in exchange for our death. See, Jesus dying on the cross and us accepting him by faith doesn't make us perfect. But because the Holy Spirit lives in us and he lives through us, we will have more holy tendencies. And ultimately, the life that he puts within us allows us to enter through that narrow gate, to travel that narrow path, and enter in to eternity in God's presence. The second thing that I think Jesus would teach us here is, is not just the fact that there is, there is a specific way to enter into heaven. He says that when you're on that path, there are going to be certain evidences that are obvious to everyone around, including yourself. Look at verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles, or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you will recognize them by their fruit. Evidence here in, in, in Jesus' words, evidence is described as fruit. Now, I know that, that there are some people that are out there that read this passage and, and say, Jesus is not talking about salvation here. He's not talking about the individual saved person. He's talking about looking out for false teachers. And that is certainly true. That is what Jesus is teaching about here. He's saying, watch out for those that would lead you in the wrong direction. But a person can use the same method of testing for false prophets as they can for testing for false believers. We can use this method, in fact, to test our own salvation. And when Jesus does this, when, when Jesus is teaching here, he uses the common knowledge about fruit trees. Let me ask you a question. Where, where do you get a fig? If, if you wanted to make fig jelly, you wouldn't go to a thorn bush to pick figs. Fig. Figs. Where, where do you get grapes? From a grapevine. Where do you find thorns? On a thorn bush. Where do you find prickly flowers? You, you find it from a, a thistle. You know, several years ago, I didn't, I didn't really know what a thistle was. And I, I see Miss, Miss Kathy over there smiling. My boys didn't know what thistles were until about four or five years ago, and they went to, went to work for Mr. Gerald on his cattle farm. And one thing Mr. Gerald hated was thistles. And after working with Mr. Gerald for two summers, my boys began to hate thistles because Mr. Gerald hated them because it, it would cause the, the cattle not to eat grass in a, in a certain area because they didn't want to get pricked by those thistles. And then it was my boy's job to go out in the field and get rid of these thistles so the cows could go there and eat. 
And I didn't know what a thistle was, but, but after that, that first summer, every time the boys came home and, and the grass started growing during the springtime and they were having to cut grass, and they, they'd look at me and say, Daddy, you've got to do something about them thistles in the yard. They, they couldn't stand thistles. It, it ingrained in them a hatred for thistles. And they could, we'd be driving down the road and all of a sudden would, Joshua would, oh, there's a thistle out there in that field. You know how he learned what a thistle was? When you go to pick a thistle, it'll poke in you. See, that's the fruit that it produces. And when you've experienced that fruit, when you experience what that plant produces, you become very quick to know what it is, what it looks like. So I didn't grow up worried about thistles. I grew up worried about sand spurs. Anybody else out here walk barefooted in your yard and figure out real quick what a sand spur plant looks like? You notice it because of the fruit that it produces. Jesus says here, you will know them by their fruit. You'll know what kind of tree it is by its fruit. He says the same thing is, is true about people. You'll be able to know a false teacher from a true tree. The true teacher because of what fruit that they produce in their life and the same thing is true about a Christian you'll know whether someone is a genuine Christian whether they have genuine salvation or not by the fruit that they produce and only those who enter the narrow gate and walk along the narrow path produce the kind, the kind of desirable fruit that the Bible teaches that a Christian should produce these are the evidences of your salvation you know, and a lot of times people will come to me and they'll ask me, well, well, well preacher, I've been going to church for a while now. How, how do I know if I've been saved? How do I know if I am genuinely a believer? How do I know if I'm getting into heaven? I want to give you a couple of, of Bible references that you can go back and you can look at and you can see that and you can see whether that type of fruit is in your life. Galatians chapter 5 talks about what we call the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. And it goes on and it says, against these things there is no law. There's no law against those things because you don't need a law against it. Because those things are always looking out for the betterment of others. And, and then in 1 John, the, the entire letter of 1 John talks about the type of love that a believer should have. The type of love that only comes from following God and, and Christ living inside of you. And, and I tell folks, if, if, if you want to know for sure if you're saved, go look at those evidences and then compare your life to those things. Are those the things that you see in your life? And then I told you I'd give you a very practical way. This is a very practical way of knowing whether or not you're believed, you're a believer or not. Think about when you gave your life to Christ. Now, now that, that should bring up the first one question right away. I've had a lot of people that will tell me when, 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 they try to, when they come to join a church that I'm pastoring, and I say, okay, well, tell me when you came to know Christ. They'll say, oh, well, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. The Bible says that we're born into this world as sinners. The only cure for that is placing faith in Jesus Christ. And, and that is a moment, that is, a, that is an occurrence, that is an event in your life that should be made note of. And the way you make note of that, when people ask me, how do I know if I'm true? Think about your life before you became a believer. What characterized your life? And now what is your life like now? What characterizes your life now? Does it look more like the fruits of the Spirit? Or does it look like the verses that follow right after that in Galatians 5 that talk about the fruits of the flesh? And, and I tell people, if, if there's no difference in what your life was like before you became a Christian and what your life is like after you became a Christian, then you didn't become a Christian. And so that's the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, is, is I'm, am I living the lifestyle of a believer? And I'm not talking about on your human efforts. Let 
Jesus said even the Gentiles can do some of the things that are expected of believers. Even lost people can do some of the things some of the time that believers are supposed to do. But their life is not going to be characterized by these traits, by these evidences. And so Jesus then goes on and he says not everybody who thinks they're on the narrow path are truly on the narrow path. Not everybody who thinks they've entered through the narrow gate truly have entered through the narrow, narrow gate. What are you talking about, preacher? Not everybody who believes they're saved are saved. Not everybody who says and who thinks in their mind, I'm going to heaven when I die. Not every one of those truly are going to heaven. Well, how do I know that? Well, that's, that's what the next thing is that Jesus is talking about. Jesus addresses this in the next few verses. So look at, look at verse 21 through 20, 23 as he shows us that, that there are serious consequences to our choice. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, lawbreaker. See, there are eternal consequences to our choice between these two places and between these two paths in this life. And Jesus says there are going to be a lot of people who are fooled by Satan into believing that they're getting into the kingdom of God. There will be lots of people who will have lived what they would call a good life. There are lots of people who would be what they think of as a good person. But I want to tell you, there are going to be millions of good people who are going to be spending eternity in hell. Why? Because they didn't choose the right gate. So we've been, we've been talking a lot about this, this correct gate, this narrow gate. And, 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 and this, is, this is, Jesus is using this as a, par, as a parable type phrase. He's using this figuratively. So, so let's, let's look to see if, if the Bible ever teaches us specifically and very directly what is this narrow gate that Jesus is talking about. Well, in John chapter 10... Jesus is teaching a parable about a shepherd and sheep and a gate. But see, the, the, the disciples didn't quite understand what he was trying to teach. As, as many times the case was, I think it's because they, they didn't yet have the Holy Spirit living within them to help them to understand the Word of God coming from God himself. And so, so many times they misunderstood what Jesus was trying to teach. And so, so when they left the crowd, Jesus sat them down and he taught them privately. And this is what Jesus told them in verse 9. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Now, I don't know how much clearer you can be than that. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man sees the Father but through me. And he teaches in this passage of Scripture here that he is the door. He is the gate. He is the narrow gate that leads to the narrow path that leads to eternity in heaven. And he says that the wide gate is the one that leads to destruction. He says that the bad fruit is the one that is thrown into the fire. He also says that he that, does not, that Jesus does not know will be cast out for all of eternity. See, there are consequences to your choices in life. There are consequences to my choices in my life. But there is no decision that you will ever make that will have greater consequences than your choice about whether or not to follow Jesus or not. Your choice has eternal consequences. And Jesus says the only way to get into the kingdom of God, the only way into heaven, is by choosing to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And then Jesus gives this final illustration in verses 24 
through 27. Which inspired the, the song that we sang a little bit earlier, Firm Foundation. Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine. He's talking about the entire message, the entire uh, teachings of Jesus throughout his life. He says, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on, and, and I think it's very telling here, this, this passage doesn't say was on a rock. It doesn't say it was on some rock. It says it was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. And its collapse was great. And so in this illustration, Jesus tells about two different people, and each one of them built a house. They built their life, their existence. One built his house on the rock. This, this solid foundation of Jesus Christ. He, he built his life on trusting in Jesus to be the one to save him, to lead him, to guide him to sustain him, to provide for him. And every time that the storms came, this house or this, this life withstood those storms. And when the ultimate storm of death in this physical life comes, Jesus says that this life built on the rock will continue. That it will continue to improve and, and will continue into perfection with God for all of eternity. But then he says the other man built his house on the sand. Basically, he built his house, his life, his, his, his belief system on anything other than Jesus. And when those same storms came, when those same rains fell, when those same rivers rose and those same winds blew that the other house withstood, when those came, it... It destroyed the house. And Jesus says, this man is called a foolish man. And then Jesus closes out this message with, with this final truth. He says, those who hear and heed his teachings are the wise. Their lives and eternities are secure on Christ. Those who do not heed his teachings are the foolish. Their lives and their eternities are unstable. They will be destroyed. Not that they might be destroyed. They will be destroyed. And he says their fall will be great. And their eternity is one of separation from God. As our musicians come to lead us in a song of invitation, let me ask you this simple question. Which one of those two ways would Jesus describe your life? Which one of those two ways would you describe your choice? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt? Do you know without any uncertainty that your hope and your trust and your faith is on Jesus Christ the rock? Do you know that if, if something were to happen to you when you leave this place, do you know without a shadow of a doubt that when you leave this place, if you were to get in a, in a car wreck and, and, and your life was to be taken, do you know without a shadow of a doubt that when you left this earth that you would enter into eternity in heaven with Jesus? Do you know that beyond a shadow of a doubt? It, you know, any, any time a message like this is preached to a to a number of people of, of this magnitude and, and you know I can't help but believe that there's somebody here today who if they're honest with their self they would have to say you know preacher I, I don't know I don't know that if I was to leave this place or I don't know that if, if God was to allow some great storm to come and to, to destroy this building and kill everyone in it I don't know that I would immediately enter into heaven. I don't know 
if I would go to hell. But I want to tell you, that's, that's a horrible place to be. That's a horrible way to have to live life, not knowing where your eternity is. There's, there's no way to have true joy. There's no way to have true peace. There's no way to have any type of goodness in this life that lasts more than just a moment when you have to worry about eternity. You know, you know I heard it, it taught this, this week in a, in a sermon that I was listening to. You know, you know we think, in, in our society, we think that Christianity is the answer to every little problem that we have in life. No, it's not. Christianity is not a guarantee of what we call a good life. Christ is the guarantee of eternal life. It's, it's a promise of, of the things to come, not what's right now. What we get from Jesus now is what allows us to endure this life until we reach eternity. And so I just I, I, can't, I can't leave this moment right now without allowing you to make a decision that would give you that certainty. You know, and I have no way of knowing who you are. I have no way of knowing if, if this whole message that God gave me today was about you or who this message was for. But I can't help but think that, that God gave this message so that, the, so that somebody coming here today that did not have that certainty, that they would be able to leave here today knowing for sure that if anything happened to them, that if they died, that they would now go to heaven whereas this morning if they would have died they would have gone to hell and I want to tell you there's, there's no fancy words there's no, there's no special prayer that you have to pray there's, there's nothing like that it's, it takes faith faith just to believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation and that you ask him to pay for your sin debt that's all it takes. And so if that's where you find yourself this morning, if, if you're that person that God brought that message here for today, then I encourage you, you, you before we even stand up and start singing, you don't have to wait on, on anybody else. You, you stand up, you come to this altar, and you kneel down before God right now, and you say, God, I am a sinner. I don't deserve eternal life. I don't deserve to be in your presence. But because you love me, I ask you to forgive me of breaking your law. Forgive me of my sins. And I place my trust in what you did on the cross for me to give me eternal life. And I ask you to save me. If that's the desire of your heart, you, you come and you kneel down before him and you tell him right now. You guys can go ahead and stand up as, as somebody may be trying to make their way. You go ahead and stand up. Or maybe you're here today and, and you just want to thank God for saving you. Because you know that you don't deserve it. You know that you haven't earned eternal life. But you know that Jesus has granted it to you. And you just want to come praise Him. You want to come thank Him. Or maybe you're here today and you know a loved one. Somebody dear to you. Somebody close to you who does not know Jesus. You want to come and you want to pray for them. Pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to speak to them and call them. Maybe you got some other need. Whatever your need is, you come to this altar and pray. If there's anything I can pray with you about, anything that the Lord's leading you to share with me, you do that, and I'd be happy to pray with you. But don't leave here today without answering that calling, that drawing that God is placing on your heart right now. Whatever that is, come to this altar as we sing together. Never
agenda I'm sorry I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence And I just want
nothing else, nothing else will do. I'm caught up in your presence, and I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy. just a second um, you know this this moment is has, has like we talked about this morning has very serious consequences and you know I don't I don't know what anybody's decision was I don't know what anyone um, prayed while you're sitting here something between you and God something uh, within your heart, within your spirit as you prayed. But I also know that if there was anybody that at this moment came to the Lord and asked for forgiveness and, and placed their faith in Him, I know that Satan is going to try to get into your head and he's going to try to tell you, oh, well, well nothing happened there. What, what, you, what you did at that altar in that church, there was, there was nothing real about that. And so I, I know that Satan is going to be attacking you. Maybe, maybe he's already been trying to place those thoughts into your head even now. And so I know how important it is that, that you have people, that you have other believers praying for you as you enter into this, this time in your life where you've placed your faith in in Jesus Christ so that so that as Satan does try to bring these attacks at you that you have other people standing alongside you and praying for you and lifting you up and so I encourage you if if, if you if, if you came to this altar and you prayed and you asked Jesus to save you if you gave your life to him please before you leave this place let somebody know tell somebody that you placed your faith in Jesus Christ today and ask them to be praying for you. They'll be excited to do that. They'll be overjoyed to be able to do that. And, and I encourage you to, to, to continue to, to make that public. Tell people what has happened in your life. Because Jesus teaches us things that we, that we bring into the light. Those are the things that that remain those are the things that stay there things that we keep in the dark we keep hidden are still susceptible to to satan and and his lies and him leading us astray so if you if you asked jesus to save you today tell somebody that before you left before you leave here today you, you may not be comfortable with with saying it right now but when you when you get into your private conversation with those that are near you those that that you love and you know that love you you tell them that but but maybe there is somebody here today that would would say without any without any shame that I gave my life to the Lord today I just I just want to know if, is there anybody that would like to say that would just like to to state that that they've given their life to Jesus today like I said before you leave Please tell somebody. Have somebody pray with you so that you have people that are lifting you up. Now this time we, we are going to continue with our worship. We're going to continue to, to go before the Lord with, with singing in, in just a minute. But uh, we're also going to worship to Him through our giving. And so, so I invite you to, to join me as we pray that God would receive this and He would honor that and He would use that to grow His kingdom. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, I do thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the word. Jesus, who came, took on flesh, and became the word. So that we would have a way of understanding you, at least in a little capacity that we're capable of. That we would have this understanding of what life is all about. And Lord, most importantly, that we would have the answers to that that most important question of how do I get into the kingdom of God? And Lord, I want to pray right now for anyone that might have prayed just a few minutes ago and asked you to be their Savior, who asked you to forgive them of their sin. Lord, I pray that you would continue to, to lift them up. Lord, I pray that you would embolden them to tell someone else so that so that that person can be praying for them, can be encouraging them, and, and even holding them accountable. But Lord, I just thank you for the gift of eternal life. And Lord, we worship you because you are the source of that eternal life. And Lord, as we seek to worship you through, through giving back to you as you've, as you've commanded us to through our tithes and, and as you've urged us to through our uh, giving above and beyond that tithe, Lord, we pray that you would allow us to be generous givers, joyful givers. And that you would then take those gifts that we give to you and you would use them to reach one more person for the kingdom of God. And Lord, we ask you to do that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, those men that are going to help us with uh, worship through giving are going to come forward. Join us for VBS as we study Romans 12 too and are challenged to recognize the difference between the half-truths of culture and God's unchanging truth. Orcas are waiting to be spotted. Kites will soar in the misty seaside breeze. Tide pools are ready to be explored and the sea lions can't wait to meet you. We will learn to not be conformed to this world at VBS, but it won't be possible without you. From worship rally to snack and recreation time, Volunteers like you make the difference. We need you to make Breaker Rock Beach happen. Find out how to become part of the biggest week in a kid's life and teach them that God's truth never changes.
All right, so as you can tell, Vacation Bible School is coming up, and the, the statement there was find out how you can get involved. Uh, Miss Ree, raise your hand. Miss Donna, raise your hand. If you want to get involved, see one of these two ladies, and they will, they will put you to work. Or you could sign up in the, in the back in the foyer. There's a sign-up sheet there. You, you put your name down there, and you may not know what you want to do. You may, just, you may just be willing to do whatever it is that God leads you to do. Put your name down there and put anywhere. Uh, that will work as well. They'll, they'll find a spot for you. They'll put you to work. Um, but, yeah, we've, we're looking forward to Vacation Bible School. Our dates are uh, July 7th through the 12th, so go ahead and put that on your calendar uh, and be, be ready for that. Um, and keep collecting cans, empty cans, washed-out cans. Uh, bring your cans back in, and there's some, some crafts, some decorations and things that, that they are going to be making using those cans. And I'm told it doesn't really matter what size can it is. If you've got the, the big cans, that'll work. They'll just make bigger whatever it is that they're going to make. If it's the smaller cans, they'll make small ones. So uh, bring your cans in. Um, I also want to remind you that um, during this month, the month of, month of March, uh, we're going to be participating in the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And uh, folks who've, who've been in church life for a while recognize that name, or at least in Southern Baptist life, they recognize that name and they know that that means missions offerings that support missionaries here in North America. Uh, hopefully next Sunday I'll have a little bit of a, a video that will, will tell you who Annie Armstrong was and why we honor her with this offering. Uh, so you can learn a little bit more about that. But, but consider, pray about what it is that God would have you and your family to give toward, in, uh, toward North American missions. I keep wanting to say international, but that's Lottie Moon. Um, our goal for the church this year is 5,000. Uh, as best as I can remember, I talked with, I can't even remember whether I talked with Miss Marie or Miss Stephanie. Uh, with you, with Miss Stephanie to, to remind me of what our goal was last year. And we set it at 5,000 last year, and I think we came up just a little bit short, uh, like 100 or $150, something like that, short of that. So, so we're going to set that as our goal again this year, and Lord willing, we'll be able to meet that goal and pass that. So be, be praying about what, uh, what you and your family would give toward the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. All right, and I can't remember what order I put them up there, so just slide the next one. Uh, upcoming youth events, um, Saturday, March 16th, that's this Saturday. Uh, there's going to be a, a youth event at New Life, uh, New Life Assembly uh, in between Latta and Dillon. Uh, that's going to be at 5 p.m. Any more information about that one that we need to share? If you come and let them know, let Stephanie or Stephanie know. Uh, and then next Sunday night, March the 17th, uh, at 5 p.m., they're going to be at Marion Baptist for a youth rally there. 5 p.m. is when they're going to be eating, and then the service will start at 6 uh, right after that. All right, if you have any other questions, see uh, one of the Stephanies. And uh, our Living Last Supper practice, men, we're going to meet this afternoon again at 5 o'clock. Uh, we'll meet in the adult classroom down the hallway. We're gonna, never mind, we're going to meet in the fellowship hall. Uh, that's right, we did say that. We're going to meet over in the fellowship hall tonight at 5 o'clock. So, so try and make, if you volunteer to help with that and you have a part with that, uh, please be here at that time. All right, our next announcement is women's ministry. Um, our WM is going to be meeting Tuesday, March the 12th at 10 a.m. in the morning uh, for those ladies that don't like to be out at dark. And then the other ladies who don't mind being out at dark, they'll come at 6 o'clock, and Miss Mom will have some things to, to work on uh, there. And Sporting Clay Family Outing is going to be March the 23rd, uh, 12 noon, Backwoods Quail Club in Georgetown. It's not actually in Georgetown. It's between between him and William Georgetown. Um, wonderful place to go in and shoot, shoot uh, sporting clays or skeet and things like that. All right, let's see what else is on here uh, that I need to share with you. Anything else on the slides? Our normal schedule of activities and uh, children's practice. We'll pick back up uh, this afternoon at 5 o'clock, uh, so keep that in mind. Um, also, let you know, I haven't put a slide up there yet, but March 24th is going to Sunday before Easter. Uh, is going to be our children's Easter presentation. And so uh, they'll be presenting that day. And so I'm sure we want to invite grandparents and uncles and cousins and, and neighbors and anybody that you want to invite, please invite them to come and, and see the hard work that, that our kids program has put into presenting 
to you. They're, um, like I said, practicing Sundays at, at 5 p.m. And also, uh, we announced last Sunday uh, that Miss Carly Wilkes, our missionary in Mexico, we've, uh, we've asked her to pray about and to consider being a part of our mission team to Honduras this coming summer, uh, June the, the 22nd through the 29th. And she would love to. And one of our deacons mentioned that there might be people within the congregation that would, would like to bless her uh, by helping her to be able to, to participate in this trip financially. And so uh, it, we're going to be doing that this Sunday and next Sunday. And so if you would like to give toward Miss Carly's trip, uh, you can do that. Just put on your envelope or on your check uh, to uh, Carly for Honduras, and we'll make sure that gets to the right place. All right, anything else that I have forgotten to mention? Yes, I'm sorry, I did not have that on my list. The, the, the kids from Siena College are going to be working through Habitat for Humanity that typically come each year. They're going to be coming March the 23rd. They're arriving on a different day this year than they normally do. Normally they arrive on a Sunday evening, correct? Uh, this year they're going to be arriving on a Saturday uh, evening. And so uh, that will shift our schedule a little bit, but we're still going to be doing mostly the same things for them and uh, like providing breakfast and things of that nature. So. Um, I'm sure Miss uh, Miss uh, Marie or somebody will be in, in in touch with you if you have helped in that in the past, and if you have not helped in the past with that, and you would like to, please see Miss Marie. All right, and the next week we'll uh, go ahead and remind you VIP will be meeting March 21st at 11 a.m. And those are on the same day, Brotherhood and okay, uh, 21st as well. Next week our Brotherhood is going to be meeting March 21st at 6:30. Anything else? All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for today. Again, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, that we have that as a, as a light to, get, to guide our path and to, to help us as we seek to please you. But Lord, most of all, I just ask you, Lord, that, that you would give each and every person here today that assurance to know whether they are saved, whether they are not, because that is the most important question we could ever ask. And those that are not saved, Lord, I pray that you would let them know that so that they can turn to you before it is too late. And those that are saved, Lord, I pray that you would allow them to be able to, to see those evidences, that fruit in their life that confirms that they are your child, that they are a child of God. And Lord, then we can live out with peace, and we can live in boldness, sharing the gospel message as we leave this place. And Lord, we ask you for that, and we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.